Coming up this week on Ride the Lightning, the Tesla Motors unofficial podcast, Tesla powers through a bit of bad news, but autopilot improvements are coming and Model 3 supercharging logistics may have just been revealed. Happy Labor Day weekend, everybody. I'm Ryan McCaffrey. This is Ride the Lightning, the Tesla Motors unofficial podcast for the aforementioned Labor Day holiday weekend here in the U.S. Anyway, September 4th, 2016. And uh, I'll tell you, I've just, I'm actually recording in the middle of the afternoon for once. Got a little uh, quiet time in the house. Maggie the Boxer is snoozing away. I just took her to her, uh, what is currently her last a rehab appointment for her for her bad leg. She's still. We're gonna have to continue with home exercises to keep her leg strengthened forever. But uh, you know, can't keep spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars on the on the uh, the water tank treadmill rehab work as as great as it is. But I have to say, if uh, any of you are dog owners out there, or you're going to be getting a dog at some point, I've had pet insurance for Maggie's whole life, and overall, it's been very useful. But I would say, I would actually say, uh, do more research than I did. I uh, Granted, there are more insurance companies now than there were 10 years ago, because Maggie's 10 now, but I, I would probably not recommend Nationwide, which used to be VPI. That's what it was when I first joined. But just a lot of, uh, sort of, they classify a lot of things as breed hereditary conditions, with, you know, even when they're puppies, just because they're sort of predisposed to it. So look around, do your homework. Um, I mean, that's not to completely badmouth nationwide. I mean, I I went ahead and renewed it because I shopped around and uh, starting a new policy on another company for a 10-year-old dog with a heart condition and a a nerve problem in her leg was actually going to be even more expensive. So I went ahead and renewed with nationwide, even though it's not that amazing, but uh, they still do cover a lot and you know, for me, with a with a with a pure breed dog, you know, they tend to be more prone to things. But anyway, that's my that's my uh, dog owner tip of the week. If you if you happen to be getting a dog or are considering pet insurance, just my two cents on that. Anyway, uh, a reminder that the Patreon exclusive bonus episode, the third one, or maybe even the fourth one now. No, the third one is up this weekend as well. That's for folks pledging ten dollars or more to the Ride the Lightning Patreon. We're going to be hearing, so uh, these are the folks that are in it. So if you hear your name, uh, be sure to head over to the Patreon and check it out if you are pledging. So Thomas from Southern California, Norman, uh, pardon me, Norman from Carlsbad, Richard from the UK, Brian, aka Tesla 8, our friend Lawton from Chicago, Ben from Calgary, uh, Robert from Chicago, all of you are featured in the Ride the Lightning bonus, Patreon exclusive bonus episode number three. So with those housekeeping notes out of the way, let's get to the week in Tesla news. And it was a tough week for Tesla and certainly for Elon Musk specifically. You know, there are always going to be downs to go with the ups. It's not, it's never just all ups. You know, it, it, the, the, the roller coaster can't be a roller coaster if, it, if it's, you know, it's not fun if it's just always going up. You got to have down to then come back up and have the fun. But uh, you may, many of you may have heard about the SpaceX incident this week, the Falcon 9 rocket explosion that occurred on the launching pad during a test at Cape Canaveral in Florida, and it cost Facebook the $200 million satellite that they were having SpaceX send up for them. That satellite was going to be used as part of Facebook's ongoing mission to bring affordable internet to to less developed countries. So, um, you know, that's, that's obviously not good. Fortunately, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to, Zuckerberg can afford it, but it's, you know, it's, it obviously delays things. It's, it's never good for something like this to happen. Fortunately, nobody was injured. No, nobody was harmed. So that's, that's the best news of all. But, uh, and then w- uh, more so for Tesla, well, or I should say, in addition, the stock price took a hit this week after investors, Got worried about cash burn and the uh, the Solar City deal as that sort of starts to starts to narrow in. So let me start with the rest of the bad news first, so that then we can turn the rest of the episode around to more positive things. 
Uh, so Bloomberg obtained an internal email, which was verified to be accurate, from Elon Musk to everyone at Tesla, really just encouraging everybody to, to really kick butt for the, for the next four or five weeks to finish the quarter strong. Uh, here's some quotes from it. This is Elon Musk writing to Tesla employees. He says, The simple reality of it is that we will be in a far better position to convince potential investors to bet on us if the headline is not Tesla loses money again, but rather Tesla defies all expectations and achieves profitability. Uh, he says, That would be amazing. Uh, the email says that Tesla, quote, is on the razor's edge of achieving a good Q3, but it requires building and delivering every car we possibly can while simultaneously trimming any cost that isn't critical, at least for the next four and a half weeks. This is an email, by the way, from August 29th. So there's the 0.5 weeks. We're now down to four weeks. He continues, I thought it was important to write you a note directly to let you know how critical this quarter is. The third quarter will be our last chance to show investors that Tesla can be at least slightly positive cash flow and profitable before the Model 3 reaches full production. Because, of course, they're going to be needing a lot of cash to get the Model 3 into production. He says, uh, he says, quote, It would be awesome to throw a pie in the face of all naysayers on Wall Street who keep insisting that Tesla will always be a money loser. You know, when I read this, I thought that my, honestly, my thought was, he's human. <laughs> he's human after all, because here's a guy who is not phased by much. Uh, he's taken criticism. He's taken heat from so many angles, from so many sources. And here he is, you know, r sort of showing a bit of, uh, hum not that he isn't, not that he's inhuman, but you know, I'm sort of referencing the, uh, just making a joke about how he seems to be a, a, a super robot. But you know, this is uh, Elon showing some humanity here, just saying that not that the stock price necessarily matters to him, but but the fact that you know, I mean, investor confidence is important for the future of the company. But he, you know, he he emotionally he wants to show the rest of the world, hey. We're, we're doing this and we're going to succeed instead of just cons people consistently doubting. And, and you know, it's, it's important. It is important for, for Tesla to in the ultimately achieve profitability. And he is pushing the company to do just that this quarter. So we'll see, uh, we'll see what happens there. It's going to be very, very interesting to see what happens at the end of Q3. And I'll tell you what, if they do attain profitability, even if by a very small margin, how will investors react to that? Will the stock price go up? Will it stay flat? Um, you, you can never... What I've learned from observing the Tesla stock price over the last number of years is you can't... You seemingly can't predict Wall Street, at least as it pertains to Tesla. I don't pretend to know anything about investing or about trading or about stocks or really, but from just observing Tesla so closely for the last number of years, Wall Street doesn't seem to know what to do with them. I mean, you know, the stock, of course, took a meteoric rise after the Model S came out and, and was, you know, the best car in the world. It was getting all these awards. And it's continued to go up, and it's been, you know, over $200 up until this week, really, with, with very few exceptions. So, you know, if, if they do hit that profitability, uh, I, I hopefully Tesla, uh, rather, investor confidence will uh, will be reflected in a in an increased stock price because I know a lot of you out there do have Tesla stock and are maybe counting on it to help fund your Model 3 or, or uh, fund something important in your life. Next story this week comes to us from the state of Missouri, as uh, some people like to call it. I don't even know if people that live there like to call it that. I know we have a, we have a strong St. Louis contingent in the Ride the Lightning audience, so please correct me on uh, what locals prefer their state pronunciation to be. But in Missouri, uh, they, Tesla has been ruled against. A judge ruled that Tesla Motors will not be able to sell its vehicles directly to Missouri customers outside of having an independent franchise dealer. In other words, they're no longer going to be able... They have a store, but apparently they're no longer going to be able to sell vehicles directly. They're going to have to turn it into a gallery, which is what they have in Texas, in the Texas Triangle. Uh, well, is, is Austin, no, because the triangle 
is San Antonio, right? Anyway, forget it. <laughs> in tech, in the lo their locations in Texas are galleries. But um, this is via Teslarati, by the way, a fantastic Tesla site. The ruling set forth by Cole County Judge Daniel Green also stated that Tesla was given a franchise dealer license in 2014 by the Missouri Revenue Department to operate its Kansas City storefront. Judge Green ruled that these actions violated laws, stating that, quote, a single entity may not manufacture vehicles for sale in Missouri and possess a Missouri new motor vehicle dealer license. Shocking. I know you're about to be shocked by, by what I'm about to say. Uh, the rest of the Tesla-Rati story includes the little tidbit here. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association. See, you knew they were going to factor in here at some point. They sued the State Department last year in order to block Tesla from selling its vehicles in the state. The association argued that, quote, manufacturers do not sell cars themselves, but do, do so through a network of licensed dealers. The structure, separates, uh, structure of separate roles for manufacturers and dealers is established by statute and reflects wise public policy. So basically, they're trying to go, they, they sued going, but the law, the thing says this. You have to go by that, even if it's dumb and outdated. But for now... And, and judges are unfortunately beholden to those sorts of things. So, uh, and Tesla Roddy adds, by the way, that Missouri would join Arizona, Michigan, Texas, Connecticut, Utah, and West Virginia as the, what I refer to as battleground states here in election year, battleground states for Tesla. And, you know, this whole battle with dealers feels to me like a, just one giant political game of whack-a-mole, doesn't it? It, it, one goes down and another pops up. Fortunately, it is proving to be a winning game for Tesla in the long run. But make no mistake, this is absolutely a war and not a battle. So once again, for those of you in Missouri, and I know I, there are plenty of Missouri listeners out there, you can do your part by contacting your elected officials and uh, do so in writing. Put it in writing, in an email, in a letter, in both, uh, and let your elected officials know that as your elected, re elected representative, you want them to support Tesla's ability to sell cars in your state because you are a consumer who wishes to buy a fantastic product and you sh the government should not stand in the way of that uh, basic, you know, consumer right to to buy things that are awesome and freely, you know, they sh those things should be freely, free market economics. So just write to your elected official, let them know, and uh, get your friends, get your family to help you if you can, because these that's how these battles are going to be won. You know, the, it, it, the public pressure will only help. I mean, that's, in, in some cases, that's that's what it's going to take, and it will not be done otherwise. All right. With those couple of uh, unfortunate, not-so-great stories out of the way, let's get on to the fun stuff, shall we? We're going to start with a, a fantastic, fun little story that just will get, should help give you a laugh. I know it did for me. You, you snoring over there, Mags? Boy, she's really out. Uh, when she goes in that water tank, it, it, it totally wears her out because she's spending 20, uh, I think it's 20 straight minutes on a treadmill, but in chest deep water. So just think like if you were having to d d uh, run in a treadmill for tw 20 minutes, except the water was, was uh, belly button deep, you'd be tired after 20 minutes, especially if you were the equivalent of about 70 years old, which is, uh, which is about what Maggie is. If the old dog years adage applies anyway. So, uh, my friend Jeff sent this to me, and the article is on uh, from Clean Technica is the site. G I, the uh, gas car dealer association head, get this, says that gas cars are dead if the Model Three ships. Uh, the executive director of Gasoline and Automotive Services Dealers of America, a gentleman by the name of Mike Fox, said, "Quote." If Tesla can deliver on its current promises with the Model 3, gas vehicles are history. It's horse and buggy days. How about that? This, this is, uh, as the Clean Technica article points out, this isn't just 
you know, uh, this isn't, say, Elon Musk saying this or someone, you know, with a, with a, a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, and a, a specific interest in electric vehicles. This is actually someone with the opposite interest. This is the executive director of the gasoline and automotive services dealers of America saying that uh, ICEs are going to go the route of the horse and buggy when the model, if, if the Model 3 ships. So uh, I thought that was, that was a pretty cool thing to hear because that's usually the kind of stuff that doesn't make its way into the public. It may get said, but it's usually said behind closed doors. That same article referenced uh, another fun quote from a Wall Street Journal article. Now this one is from the chief executive of ChargePoint, uh, which of course, is, as those of you who own Teslas now are probably familiar they are a big deal maker of charging stations. They've got a lot of charging stations around the country. This is Pascal Romano, and he says we have. Uh, he he mentions that the uh, most manufacturers that he has spoken with have EVs in their plans. He says we have seen their internal plans to just electrify everything. So that's good. I mean, that's what Elon Musk wants. Remember, always think back to the mission statement. That is exactly what Tesla exists for, which is to spur all of this on. And it finally, it's taken a number of years already, and it's, you know, it's still not done yet by any stretch of the the imagination, but it appears the gears of here to finally be turning on the, uh, on the automotive industry with regard to the manufacturer and, uh, the taking seriously of electric cars. Elon did spend a little time on Twitter this week. Not a lot, but he uh, mentioned a few notable items. First, he mentions, quote, major improvements to autopilot coming with version 8 and 8.1 software via a standard over-the-air update. That, uh, and those improvements are going to come primarily through advanced processing of radar signals. He had said at the time, writing a post now with details will publish on Tesla website later today. But then he mentioned it was postponed in the wake of the, the SpaceX uh, satellite explosion. So uh, that has still not gone up. It, knowing me, it'll probably go up right after this podcast publishes on Sunday morning. But hey, at least they'll give me something to talk about next week. Uh, he also mentioned, by the way, the, as far as the timing of version 8.0, He said, we need to do one more minor rev on 8.0, and then we'll go to wide release in a few weeks. So uh, mark your calendars, Tesla owners, for approximately my birthday, September 20th, by the way. If you're, if you're, if you had, if you have a hundred grand in your pocket and want to buy me a a Model X 90D, though, no, um, yeah, so look, look for that later this month. Although again, uh, Tesla time, Elon Musk time, not always necessarily the most reliable source of time, but it appears, it sounds like they caught, they caught one last thing. If there's a, he says, well, there's one more minor rev they need to do. Now, uh, as part of this, Electrek uh, dug out a little bit from their sources, and apparently Tesla is going to add a bit more restriction to autopilot, but fortunately not too much. They say, according to sources familiar with the autopilot program, Tesla will add a safety restriction that will result in not only the autopilot disengaging after alerts are repeatedly ignored, but also blocking the driver from re-engaging autopilot after it was automatically disengaged. The driver will not be able to reactivate autopilot until the car is stopped and put in park. So far... Uh, so, uh, yeah, apparently this is only going to affect auto steer and not the traffic adaptive cruise control. Now, the, uh, Electrek notes that the goal of the new restriction appears to be to encourage Tesla owners to respond to the visual alert and not ignore them. So if your car is yelling at you, don't, uh, don't, uh, just ignore it. You got to pay attention. Otherwise the car is going to pull itself over and then not let you have autopilot back again until you put the car in park and think about what you've done, young man. <laughs> Sorry, I know that's that's dumb. You don't come to this podcast for comedy, nor should you, because I am no comedian, friends. But uh, yeah, so I mean, I'm glad to see 
that that this uh, this change isn't too drastic because you know there's a fine line to walk, right? You we don't want to see Tesla get dragged down into a, a an abyss of lawsuits, right? That's the last thing we want you know, when when Tesla should be out there changing the world for the better and making awesome products that we all want. But you also don't want a few uh, bad apples out there spoiling the bunch for the rest of us. You know, the, the, we don't we don't want the government to have to step in with enough complaining enough and enough problems and then actually put a, you know, a, a federal regulation on Tesla or on, you know, autopilot like systems. So it's uh, hopefully this this will help keep the government at arm's length and not, uh, you know, not have them sniffing around looking to look into place restrictions on Tesla or or autopilot uh, and its and its features. Here's an interesting thing this week. I, I was very fascinated by this, and I know I've got Australian listeners. I don't know if I've got anybody in Hong Kong, but for my friends in Australia, Electrek, again, uh, doing good work out there. Electrek has learned that Tesla is entering the car insurance business, starting with pilot programs in Australia and Hong Kong. The new program is called Insure My Tesla, and it features custom insurance plans for Tesla's underwritten by bigger insurers partnering with Tesla. Uh, in, uh, in Australia, Electrek notes, some Tesla owners have reported being offered plans starting at $1,200 Australian currency, which is approximately $900 per year in U.S. dollars. The obvious question here is, will this come to the U.S. and other markets? Uh, or is Tesla just kind of, you know, you would think that they're dipping their toe in the water here, Uh, And seeing how it goes, seeing if it's worth... Because, of course, just like any company, Tesla has limited resources, right? They don't have unlimited resources. They're trying to do the Solar City deal. They're trying to get Model 3 off the ground. There's a million things. They're trying to expand the supercharging network. They're trying to expand the the service network. You know, that is in dire need of expansion in in advance of Model 3. And just the fact that Tesla is producing more and more S's and X's every single year. But uh, this does appear to be a, a test bed of sorts. And so I'll tell you, if it comes to the U.S., I would absolutely give Tesla insurance serious consideration for my Model 3. And, and it, honestly, for, it's for one simple reason. One simple reason. And that's that I trust Elon Musk more than I trust my insurance company or any other insurance company. Not that I have like a big problem with my insurance company or, or any other one, but... You know, I, I, Elon Musk is, uh, is a lot more trustworthy for, to me than, uh, than pretty much, well, most other people and most other, most other public figures for that matter. I mean, of course, I mean, of course I'd price around, uh, you know, in my insurance now I've got multi-line discounts and umbrella policies and the whole nine yards. But if my Model 3 were better protected by Tesla themselves who understands the car and its, you know, probable self-driving, uh, you know, level four self-driving features in the future and, and the insurance implications of that if someone were to hit me while the car is driving itself, I would absolutely want them, I would, I would want them to be insuring the car if they're going to offer me a fair deal. As, as long as the price is fair, I mean, I'll tell you, I would even be willing to pay a little more uh, not a lot more, but a little more for insurance from Tesla themselves if it's going to result in in uh, either better co- outright better coverage for my Model 3 or uh, the more confidence in that coverage. If I were to have more confidence that if something were to happen, that my Tesla insurance, that Tesla would do the right thing by me. So let's keep an eye. We're going to keep an eye on this story and if any of you down there in Australia or Hong Kong take Tesla up on this, I would absolutely love to hear from you. I know uh, a phone call may not may not be free to, to our, our toll-free number here, but you can Skype me if you Skype that number, uh, which I'll, I'll mention later in the show, but I uh, would love to hear from anybody who is looking at this. Finally this week, another big story. Supercharger access appears to be going a la carte. No longer all you can eat. 
one more big scoop from Electrek. Just huge tip of the cap there. Uh, Fred Lambert and the, and the team there just do a wonderful job each and every week of staying on top of it. I mean, it, they're, it's funny. They, mo they seemingly mostly cover Tesla, but they do cover other EVs and all sort of green green driving scenarios. But uh, yeah, Electrek with a, with a big scoop here. They, now, Electrek had found evidence in the source code from Tesla's website that Tesla might sometime introduce supercharger credits. Probably, I mean, it was speculated at the time, and it was very reasonable to go along with this line of thinking, that it, that was going to be for the Model 3, because Tesla has already confirmed that the cars won't have lifetime supercharger access just straight up included in the base price. We knew it was going to be separate somehow. We just didn't quite know how. Uh, but it appears that it's going to be applied to the S and X as well because Electrek notes that sources familiar with the program, meaning the supercharger credits program, have told Electrek that Tesla is about to introduce a new supercharger credit program to unbundle the cost of supercharger access from the vehicle and consequently lower the entry price of the S and X while ensuring that the value of the supercharger network is better represented by the pricing model. And Electrek speculates that this could happen as soon as the release of Tesla's version eight uh, firmware. Now, uh, th and then they got one more update from another source with quote, knowledge of the new program now says that the price reduction uh, the, in other words, the Model S and the Model X are going to see $2,000 price cuts each uh, in, on the, in the wake of this, and that you will pay as you go in these supercharger credits. According to Electrek Source, new owners will be able to buy supercharger credits by blocks of kilowatt hour. The price will depend on local electricity rates in your country. Buying blocks of kilowatt hours... Uh, anyway, blah, blah, blah. So... Uh, from the My Tesla page, owners will be able to register a credit card number in order to make adding credit as easy as pressing a few buttons on the touchscreen of your S, X, and eventually, of course, Model 3, because every single Tesla is always connected to the mothership at all times via that cellular 4G signal. So I'll tell you, my first gut reaction to this was that I wasn't happy. I... I wanted to just pay for it with my Model 3 and never think about it again. It's just like, you know, cry once, you do it, it's done. I did that with my, um, when I bought my Infiniti 10 years ago, I bought, uh, I got a Sirius satellite radio in the car and I bought, you know, the radio was something like $500 with the car and then I bought a lifetime subscription which they stopped offering probably because they realized it was a money losing proposition. But that, and, and I, so I never had to think about it again. I didn't get a monthly bill from Sirius. I didn't get a yearly bill from Sirius. I could just always turn on, turn on that satellite radio in my car and not think about it. And then it, I did the math at one point and I think it, it paid for itself after something like seven and a half years. Uh, and I've now had the car for 10 and a half years. So it is more than paid for itself. But with the supercharging, again, I, I, so I, I thought more about it. And I thought, even if I have the car for 10 years, which I probably will, especially if you ask my wife about it, she, she insists that I have the car for 10 years. The question I asked myself was, would I ever use $2,000 worth of supercharging? If you use California's average of 12 cents per kilowatt hour and maybe say a 50 kilowatt average per supercharger stop, you know, however much that's going to be, I'd have to stop at 333 superchargers before I started, quote unquote, making money on the all you can eat price. So that's 33 times per year I would have to use it on average. Now, a round trip to Disneyland, where I just come back from, from here in San Francisco, that's like four supercharger stops. Two each way. Two down, you know, you leave your house with a full charge. It's two stops there. You're probably, you're charging at the Disneyland hotel and then two stops on the way back. So, so that's four stops out of the 33 I would need to average in a year. Now, believe me, when I get my Tesla, 
I, I've said, and I've said this on the show before, I absolutely, absolutely plan to drive it a lot more than I'm driving my car now. I'm actually, not actively, but I'm kind of trying to not drive my Infiniti as much. I'm trying to keep the mileage down because I know I don't want to have to do the tires again. I've got uh, a, a bit of an oil leak. It's burning a bit of oil, so I'm wary of that. Uh, it's minor, but, and then, uh, I just want to keep the mileage down for the, to maximize the resale value for what, when I get rid of it to get my Tesla. So, you know, and with, but with the Tesla, I want to go play, like I want to tell, I want to drive, I want to take trips to Lake Tahoe in it. I want to go like do cool weekend cruises to like Napa or down to Santa Cruz or Monterey, uh, the, 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 what is it, the 17 mile drive or whatever it's called down there, I've, which I've never done. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. I want to drive to Las Vegas. I've got some family there. Um, there's all kinds of stuff I'd love to do, but still 33 supercharger visits per year is what that sort of works out to. So the more I thought about this, the more I thought that this unbundling, you know, that, that more of an a la carte pricing it's probably a good thing, at least for me, because in fact, I realized my financially uh, financially savvy and very financially aware <laughs> wife would probably agree because she would probably say if she were here, which she's not, that the that even if paying two thousand dollars for it bundled with the car for the lifetime access, she'd probably say, well, you're paying interest on that through your car loan, through the auto loan. So it's actually even more. So uh, I did the math as well. So, you know, that means if I were to say drive the family to Disneyland in the Tesla, that that, you know, that trip's not quote unquote free because I'd have to pay for my kilowatt hour blocks at the superchargers. But in my current car, which gets around, I mean, on the, on the freeway, on the highway like that, it's low 20s miles per gallon, but it would be about... $120 in gas round trip because it's premium fuel at about $3 a gallon, which is about what premium costs in California right now, at least here in Northern California. So it'd be $120 in gas to do that trip. The If you use about 12 cents per kilowatt hour and do the whole math on, uh, on the supercharger, that would be about $24 in supercharger electricity. So quite a difference, about uh, one, well, not quite a sixth, but you know, about a fifth, about a fifth of the cost. So uh, still gonna work out to a pretty good deal. That's it for the news this week. I'm gonna take a quick breather and come right back with, uh, again, plenty more good questions in the Ride the Lightning hotline right after this. Time for the Ride the Lightning Hotline. This is your section of the show where you get a chance to participate, to call in. Whether you've got a question, comment, discussion topic, call me anytime. You just leave a message. It's a toll-free number that you can call or Skype to this number. And that number is 1-888-989-8752. That's 1-888-989-TESLA, T-S-L-A. And by the way, of course, if you know someone special with an upcoming birthday, anniversary, graduation, or some other special occasion, you can give them a unique gift of recorded voices from friends and family telling them why they're special. The recordings can be podcasted like I do or put onto a keepsake. Visit lifeonrecord.com to learn more. Our first call comes to us, I believe his name is Jesse. Sometimes with these calls, I have a little bit of time the, the either quality of the recording or quality of the call can be a little suspect, but I believe it's Jesse from Tucson, Arizona, responding to uh, my my sort of my shrugged shoulders last week, my lack of knowledge last week about why the motor did not shut down in the uh, in some of these autopilot at related accidents. So uh, Jesse, take it away. Hi, this is Jesse Tucson, on my Model S. You had a call last week uh, talking about the terrible acting of the car that the Tesla drove under the uh, truck 
and asking why the motor didn't shut off, why the system didn't shut down in that crash. Um, I had the same thought originally. I had the same question, and then I, I thought about it further, and I realized uh, a reason why they wouldn't set up the car to do that. Uh, in a worst case scenario, let's say you're you're in a uh, uh, you're in a railroad crossing, car smashes you from behind, pushes you into the railroad crossing. Would you really want the car to shut down and not be able to drive at that point? Uh, a more typical case, you're keep owned in the middle of an intersection. If the car's still functioning, you'd like to be able to pull off and get out of the way so that you're not causing more of a hazard. Um, there's a lot of scenarios like that. I, I was I was specifically thinking again in that terrible accident where the, the, the Tesla went into the truck. You know, the camera was locked off in theory, so why didn't the system, why would the, the cruise control keep going, assuming that's what happened? Now, I don't know if the cruise control only uses the radar. I suspect it does. Uh, but in that case, uh, let's say you're driving with your tr cruise control and, and a, a wire goes out on your camera or a fuse goes on your camera. Would you really want the whole system to shut down because of an, an uh, electrical fault somewhere else in the system? No, you want, you want as much of the system that still works to continue working. And so that's, it's just a much more complicated issue than it originally seemed. Now, of course, maybe there's things they can do if it detects the collision and the signal goes out, then it shuts down. Or, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's stuff they can try to enhance and improve, but it's, it's certainly not as simple as you've been in an accident, we better shut down. Uh, I just want to pass that along. It's, it's, again, I had the exact same self thought originally, so I'm certainly not saying anything to answer the original question. I had the same question, but it's, it's a much more complicated question than, than it seems on the surface. I love the show. Keep, keep on going with it. It's great. Well, Jesse, not that I didn't believe you that you were calling in from your Model S, but I heard a very Tesla specific chime in the middle of that call that proves you are telling the truth. But uh, seriously, you make some you make some good points, actually. And I guess the question is, how much does the car know in the event of an accident? Because there are certainly a lot of scenarios that are the opposite of the totally valid ones that you outline where you would want to shut the motor down. Hopefully we can get an answer from Tesla on this someday about sort of what happens in the event of an accident with autopilot engaged. Next up is Christopher from Ontario, up in Canada, uh, who mentions the new DeLorean, which I've certainly been keeping my eye on, as well as another interesting car that, uh, that could give us a hint, or at least help us form an idea of what Model 3's interior could look like. So Christopher, you're on the air. Hi Ryan, it's Christopher from Ontario, Canada, and I had a couple of things to comment on. Um, the first thing is something just came across my Facebook feed, talking about a new DeLorean that's due to come out in 2017. I thought that you might be very interested in that. Looks like they're going to have a third-party supplier for the engine, and they're going to make some cosmetic changes. The prototype uh, picture concept art looked really interesting. The second thing is, I was wondering if you were familiar with the IDS Nissan concept. Um, autonomous steering wheel that kind of rotates into the dash when you're not using it. And what you would think about something like that being a spaceship-like steering wheel for the Model 3. I thought that um, of all the autonomous concepts that I've seen, the Nissan concept seemed to be the most radical and really interesting. Anyway, I love the podcast. I've listened from episode one and... Um, can't wait to hear your thoughts on some of these ideas. Have a great day, Ryan. Bye. Well, Christopher, yes, I've, uh, of course, been keeping tabs on the new DeLorean. Uh, the DeLorean Motor Company, which is in Humble, Texas, outside of Houston, uh, it's, it's not related to the original DeLorean Motor Company. They bought the name. I, I know, actually, the two gentlemen that run the company, the president, Stephen Wynn, not the same Las Vegas uh, casino magnate, Stephen Wynn, different guy, uh, and James Espy. They're, they're both very good friends of mine. I've known them for... I've actually known them since before I got my DeLorean. I've known them since I was a teenager. They're really good guys, and it's uh, 
it's cool that they were able to get around this this old law that prevented them uh, from from assembling any cars because they have just warehouses of parts. And so yeah, I have I did keep my eye on the new DeLorean and and for me for me specifically, I'm not knocking what they're doing at all, but you know they're putting in new motors like maybe it's going to be a Toyota or something else, but some other crate motor from a, from a different manufacturer and they're going to put bigger wheels on there so that it's easier to find tires. For me, I adore the DeLorean and its looks the, the way it is so much that for me, if you change the DeLorean's engine and you change its wheels, it's kind of not a DeLorean anymore. It's a little, it's a little something else, even if the body is the same. So for me, I would rather have an original 81, 82, or 83 model, I had an 82, uh, rather than a 2017 model, even though I'm sure they're going to be a lot more fun to drive on uh, with you know much more powerful 300 horsepower plus new engines. But, uh, but by the way, and then that, that picture you, you mentioned, the, the design, that's fake. A bunch of people were tweeting me that, and that, that was just some mock-up that somebody did. The cars, it is going to be the same body. The only thing that... Uh, they're changing is again the 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 wheels the interior and the engine anyway uh as for the nissan ids concept that you mentioned which by the way so if you're following along at home and you are in a place where you can google it please do google nissan ids and specifically google image search it and you'll see plenty of pictures of the exterior but you'll also see plenty of pictures of the interior so now you, if you can see what Christopher is talking about, it's a concept for a self-driving electric car. And it, you're right, Christopher, it absolutely has a spaceship-like interior, similar to what Elon has described for the Model 3. So there could very well be hints. I mean, obviously, Nissan's not related to Elon at all. There's no crossover there. There's no nothing. But, but just this, this kind of does look like a spaceship-like interior. And, and the Model 3 interior we have seen that we're told is changing a lot, does have elements of this. You know, that very, very minimalist dashboard that's pushed way forward in the car, uh, the, the big screen in the middle, uh, so, and, then, and then just virtually nothing else. So this, this concept could give us a, some sort of hint about, about what Elon might be thinking about for the Model 3. Let's go now to Jay from Australia. I was talking, of course, talking about Australia earlier in the show, who, uh, who mentions, I, I was talking last week about my speculation about what the Model 3, the ultimate Model 3, will be capable of. I mentioned 300 miles, but uh, Jay makes a really good point that the rest of the world uses kilometers and that another number might sound pretty good too. So Jay, you're up. Hi, Ryan. It's Jay from Australia. Uh, just listening to your latest podcast uh, where you're talking about the uh, Model 3 range, I thought uh, a nice round number, rather than thinking about uh, miles, is uh, is the rest of the world and thinking about in kilometres. 310 miles is 500 kilometres, and that's certainly a nice round figure. So even if we round it up slightly to 315, that gives a really nice spread for Tesla then if there are... 215 miles and 315 miles and then they can have an in-between battery if they need it or not but just something to think about because uh, while uh, that 300 mile mark is uh, a big barrier for Americans uh, 500 kilometers is a certain certainly a big mental barrier for um, you know, most of Europe and where I am in Australia so uh, something to think about there so 310 miles is the goal, um, and uh, certainly getting to 315 is it would be a big selling point for the rest of the world. Uh, you've, you're doing a great podcast, and thanks very much. Bye. Jay, you are absolutely right. I'm being an awful American, and indeed, the rest of the world matters a lot, every bit as much, if not more so, in total than America does. So you're right. I mean, you're right. 500 kilometers is also a very nice, excellent round number. And hey, I would take 310 miles of range on the biggest battery. That's a, that's better than 300. <laughs> I would happily take it. So uh, let's let's bookmark your 
your call and see, uh, see if you end up correct on that. Final call this week comes to us from Casey down in Tampa, Florida, moving entire hemispheres from Australia to Florida. And Casey uh, wants to talk about the Model Y a little bit, which is always fun. It's always fun to speculate about the, the next SUV, uh, the next vehicle that Tesla intends to produce after the Model 3. So Casey, the floor is yours. Hey Ryan, this is Casey calling from Tampa, Florida. First off, let me let you know that I really dig everything you do. I've been following you since OXM. I uh, also love all the IGN uh, coverage and, your, and the podcast Unlocked. Uh, I'm actually calling to discuss the Model Y. Initially, I was really on the Model 3 train. One thing led to another, and I wasn't able to jump in when the pot was hot. But it actually worked out in my favor because I find now that my wife is uh, five months pregnant with our new baby. And the four-door coupe I'm driving just won't cut it. We need an SUV, and we're, we're so far a one-car household. We're trying to keep it that way. So I'm looking at the Model Y now, and I'm liking the way the Model 3 resembles uh, the way that the Model S is, and I'm hoping that the Model Y resembles more of how the Model X looks. So I, I guess my question is, when do you think we're going to start seeing some solidified information about it, possibly some, some, uh, some dates and times and maybe some pricing? I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Again, love everything you do and keep up the good work. Bye. Casey, congratulations on the imminent addition to your family. And now as for the Model Y, uh, timing-wise, I think, I mean, I've said this before on the podcast, but if the Model 3 really starts to deliver in significant numbers in 2018, I think, I mean, 2019 is the earliest we would see Model Y. I honestly think it's my my. I would put my money on 2020 for that car. I mean, I, I don't have any anything concrete to base that off of. I'm just you know trying to go on. Tesla continues. They've got so much more scaling to do. They've got so many Gigafactory batteries to produce and Gigafactory build out to do. Uh, they've got so much service. Again, as I mentioned earlier in the show, again, they've got to scale their uh, service centers to such an extreme degree compared to where they are now. And, you know, we we talked about Elon mentioned that the Y could sell a million a year on its own in his estimation. So I do think we're going to need a little bit of time. Well, Tesla is going to need a little bit of time in order to get the Y out. And then there's the other issue, which, I again, I have also mentioned on the show, on the show before, but... Will the Model Y have Falcon Wing doors? Elon had previously suggested on Twitter that it would, because he had said uh, one of the one of the two car, one of the next two cars, the three or the Y, will have Falcon Wing doors. And then later, he specifically said, "Oh, it's the Y." And then, of course, we have seen the three, and it does not have Falcon Wing doors. But will the will the Y? St- if it was originally intended to have Falcon wings, does it still have them because of the issues that the X has run into? And yes, those issues are, are working on there. They continue, it continues to get better all the time, but also the, I mean, there is a cost factor. There is a complexity factor, but there is also a, does the market want this factor? Cause we've seen some of that in, you know, yeah, it's kind of, on message boards and and it's hard to tell on a bigger scale, but there has been a sentiment of that that's, that's been around with the X like, Oh, I love this thing, but I just don't want those model model. uh, Pardon me, those Falcon wing doors. So I wonder if they'll throw them out uh, on the Y and just go with standard doors. And it's just an SUV ified or, you know, a, a CUV ified version of the model three. Um, so we'll see. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be, and then, uh, I guess looks wise, you know, you mentioned you were hoping to see it kind of bear a family resemblance to the X, the way that the three does to the S, particularly in the back and on the sides. And I'm sure it will. I'm sure you're, you will probably get that, um, again, with the possible exception of those Falcon wing doors, but I can't imagine that the three, pardon me, that the Y is going to have the Big Sky windshield. I, I'm sure that'll be a, a thing that's reserved for the luxury end uh, version, which is, of course, the X. 
But we, we shall see. I, I think maybe we'll see that car. Maybe we'll see it in 2018. Maybe it'll be unveiled, but I don't expect it. I would put my money on 2020 for that one. All right, uh, another great round of phone calls in the Ride the Lightning hotline. Again, a reminder that I get, I'm get i very, very lucky to get so many good phone calls from you fantastic listeners that uh, I found a home for the ones that I can't use on the show, and that is that Patreon-exclusive bonus episode. So go uh, take a look at that if you're curious, and I'll be right back to wrap things up right after this. Just about time to head out for another week. Uh, I would wanted to kindly ask you, if you get a chance, if you're an iTunes listener, you subscribe through iTunes, if you get a chance to leave a review of the podcast on iTunes, that would be extremely helpful. It helps with iTunes rankings and all that kind of thing. You don't necessarily have to write anything if you just do the star ranking. Uh, I mean, I suppose... I suppose I'm asking for, <laughs> I got to be careful what I wish for. If you don't like the show, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm asking you for an honest review of that too. But uh, hopefully if you enjoy the show, uh, you, might, you might feel compelled to leave a review on iTunes, which uh, would, be, would be helpful for me. Uh, I wanted to mention abstractocean.com for you Tesla owners. They've got a bunch of great Tesla accessories, a lot of little things. Their LED kit it has been uh, super useful to a lot of Tesla owners, as well as the silicone key fob pockets for those to keep those slippery little Model S and Model X key fobs from uh, wiggling away. Particularly since they're black, they can be almost impossible to find if they get like down behind a couch or you know who knows who knows where they might slither off to. So check out abstractocean.com for an excellent selection of very useful Tesla accessories. You can follow me on Twitter at DMC underscore Ryan. Email me teslapodcast at gmail.com. Dave T's fantastic weekly Tesla newsletter delivered to your email box each and every Friday morning or I guess Friday around noon if you're on the East Coast. You can sign up for that for free at teslaweekly.com. teslarati.com. Gene and the crew there, Electric Gen, they're very kind to help get the word out about the podcast and they do a great job of covering and analyzing uh, the week's Tesla news uh, in in web format. And the referral program. Yes, if you intend to purchase a Model S or Model X, you can get yourself $1,000 off. Get uh, Kevin Rapp, who has donated his code for the podcast. You can get him some prizes and get me a chance at that uh, Model X in the referral raffle drawing. So if you intend to buy an S or an X, particularly since they appear to be about to get $2,000 cheaper with the supercharger credits thing happening uh, seemingly soon. So just punch into your browser the following URL. It's ts.la slash Kevin 4901. And then you configure the car you want, order it, and you'll get yourself $1,000 off of it. And thanks so much for Kevin to, to Kevin for offering up his code so that Everybody has a chance to get something cool out of it. Finally, if you uh, subscribe to the podcast, most of you probably subscribe. That's the, the easiest way to make sure it gets to you. But if not, you can subscribe very easily on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, or uh, just hit the RSS feed, which you can find at the Tesla. Ho- uh, pardon me, at the podcast hosting site, which is teslapodcast.libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N. And I want to thank my Patreon producers. These are the folks that kindly pledge $20 or more per month. And those kind souls are Jeff Bartram, DJ Harbaugh, Pete White, Wolfgang Obergen, George Cassiopo, ZL Klein, David Brander, Nick Hoffman, Ralph Weiss, Jonathan Wales, and John Waltauer. That does it for me this week. Hope everybody has a fantastic Labor Day holiday weekend. Or if by the time you listen to the show, that's already over, I hope you had an excellent Labor Day holiday weekend and, a, and hopefully a short week of work uh, if for, for the uh, Americans and for the rest of you. Just uh, enjoy the rest of your, your holiday, your summer. The summer is unofficially coming to an end. We move to the fall, but that just means we move ever closer to the Model 3 getting into our driveways and garages. So happy electric motoring, everybody, and I'll see you next week.